Bibles or New Testaments this morning and wish to follow in the reading, turn with me to the General Epistle of James, please. The third chapter of the General Epistle of James. I began the reading in the first verse. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, Yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listed. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell." For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil word. But the wisdom it is from above is first pure and peaceable, gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. May we bow our heads in prayer, please. Our Father, this morning as we approach the day of this camp, we tell thee we're utterly and absolutely dependent upon thee. We thank thee for the help that thou hast already given. We rejoice, our Father, in all thy mercies that's been extended to us and in all that thou art enabling us to do, our Father, and endeavoring for us, our Father, to see accomplished in this camp. Bless our co-workers today and touch their bodies and minds and quicken them for their services. Bless in every need across the camp, our Father, O oh God, undergird and strengthen those whose bodies may be weak. Touch our physical, we pray thee today, and renew us, O oh God, for the conflict and the battle that's ahead. Glorify thy great name, we pray thee, and to you shall be the honor and glory and praise in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. I want to speak to you this morning on the sins of the tongue. The sins of the tongue. This ought to be a very interesting service today, for we find ourselves on very common ground here. Most of us have a tongue. Some people don't have enough tongue, I guess, they continue to seek tongues all the time. But I find I have a big enough problem with the one God's given me. Amen. The sins of the tongue. We're kind of prone in these days to classify sin, big sins and little sins, Venial sins and mortal sins and black sins and shady sins and little lies and white lies and black lies and Santa Claus lies and Easter Bunny lies and oh, we're just kind of prone to classify it. We look down on the down and out and the downtrodden and the vicious and the vile and the harlot and the drunkard and the sodomite and that and we say sinners, sinners. But the boulevard crowd and the up, the up crowd and the upper 500 crowd and the who's who's crowd and the blue blood crowd and the church leader crowd and all this we kind of classify them and kind of excuse sin. We're prone in our own selves to excuse what we condemn in somebody else. We're prone in our families to excuse in our children what we condemn in other people's children. 
It's way easier for us to see the danger and the faults and the errors and the foolishness and the folly in somebody else's child than it is mine. And we come right into the church world and it's a lot easier to excuse in the church what out in the world we'd call sin. And then we come down to our little crowd. You know that little crowd we all agree with, you know, we honey up to, you know, they rub our fur the right way and they pour a little oil or put a little salve on us when somebody hurts us or when somebody preaches to us and gets down our alley and the sword of the word cuts quick, you know, they say, well, now, honey, they surely couldn't have meant you. And in that little honey crowd and in that little palavering crowd and that little flattering crowd, we just about excuse everything in the book in that crowd because they're going along with us and agreeing with us and patting us on the back and palavering over us and they seem to understand us. I'm afraid they understand us too well. They know we're one of their clique and one of their clan, one of their crowd. Amen. Who do you always call up when you get in a tight place? When truth gets next to your heart, when the Word of God comes close to your soul, when the Spirit, who do you always call up? Somebody that'll palaver over you and flatter you and honey dovey you around? Or do you call up some old saint and say, say, I don't know what this is. And she said, it's God dealing with you. Let him deal with you. I'm glad he's speaking to you. I'm glad he's showing you. Praise God. May he keep the fire on. May he keep your feet to the fire. May he hold this thing against you. May he clear you up in this. Who do you call up? Why do you call up that individual? Isn't it true? You like to have self-pity. You like to be flattered. You like to have it eased. You like to get out from under it. You're not willing to go to the bottom and confess out and clear the slate and get right with God. And that little soothing oil and that little flattery and that little agreement with it just suits you so you just lean on that little honey dovey crutch. Amen. Now don't shout me down. Amen. More of this hanging around than what we wish to admit. There are three times when these barriers and differences and classes are swept away. One is in the time of great tragedy, when God has allowed great tragedy to come, a flood or an earthquake or a storm or a tornado or a hurricane. Beloved, it just sweeps it away, the rich and poor, the black and the white, the down and out, and the one who lives up on the boulevard. They speak together, they walk together, they converse together, they talk about the tragedy that's come, it's swept away. Another time when this is going to be swept away is in the great judgment day. When men are going to stand for who they are and what they are. When men are going to stand there on their character and face God and God will have no respect to person. Now, there'll be no alibis, no agreement, no cliques, no class, no clans, no religions, no types, or anything else. And the third place where these are swept away and God brings us down, takes away our little clannish ideas and our little cliques is when the Holy Ghost comes in real Holy Ghost power. Thank God. And we forget about our little pets and our little pampering crowd and our little clans and our little promotional ID and our little schemes and our little trickery and our little group that's always sitting together and voting together, Bill, 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 Jack, Jack, Jack. Why, just watch them. Why, how come it always like that because that little clown was sitting together? Amen. Why are you clanning and clicking and staying so close to the crowd you're in? Would you say the Holy Ghost is leading you there and they're making you more spiritual and more godlike? and they're increasing your faith and increasing your prior life, or would you have to say you're clanning with a little crowd and clicking with a little bunch for some other reason? Sin is not some little timid thing. Sin is not some little plaything. When it breaks loose and breaks forth from you and I, it's vicious, it's terrible. It breaks forth in all the power and all the force of hell behind it. Sir, it doesn't matter what's the sin of the tongue or whether it's fists doubled up and fighting out here till you're blacking eyes and bloodying noses and mashing cheeks and breaking bones and knocking teeth loose in the other fellows. It doesn't make any difference. Sin is sin. It just has its different ways of expressing itself. And because of this, we're prone to classify it and put, kind of pour water on it down here and soften it down and tone it down. Oh. The words of a tailbearer are his wounds. A tailbearer. Thou shalt not go up and down the land as a tailbearer. Whispers and backbiters, 
Paul links over in first, uh, the first chapter of Romans with adulterers and fornicators and, mur- and murderers and all these others. And right in the middle, he says, whispers and backbiters shall have no part in the kingdom of God, but the wrath of God who not only do these things, but have pleasure in them to do what? Whispering and backbiting. Did you ever classify whispering and backbiting the same as drunkenness and adultery and murder and lasciviousness and wrath? That they which do such things shall never inherit the kingdom of God. But the wrath of God smokes upon a whisperer and a backbiter. Yes. And because you whisper, you're just as liable to be given over to a reprobate mind as the adulterer, the fornicator, or the murderer. Yet some people have never conquered this whispering thing. Never. They still, pss, 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 pss. don't tell somebody else, now I'm not sure this is right. Pss, 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 pss. Oh. Let's look at this. That James writes it out for us. And I trust you're praying for us. Some things that God calls upon people to preach is not always the easiest thing to preach. And I trust you're praying. I want you to see how James brings this out. He said it's an untamed tongue. Yes, sir. An untamed tongue. Jesus, speaking of it back there, if you recall, he says... He that is angry with his brother without cause. Now they tell me, Brother Emery, I'm not a Bible teacher and don't know anything, but they tell me that without cause should not be in there. But if it should be in there, I like this explanation that one gave, without being angry at his sin, not angry at him, but angry at his sin, the sin he's committed. You can find no fellowship and you hate sin in him because God hates sin. He is in danger. of the judges, of judgment. But whosoever saith to his brother, Rekha, he is in danger of the council. But whosoever saith unto his brother, Thou fool, he is in danger of hell far. What is that? That's this thing in its degrees as God reveals it to us. There's anger, then there's resentment, and then there's wrath. You start out speaking about someone, you start out telling something, and that fire begins to burn. That fury begins to rise. And the first thing you know, Satan has driven you overboard, and the things you're saying is from a heart that's hot. An untamed tongue. He said, of all the birds and of all the beasts and of all the animals and things in the sea, hath man tamed but this tongue. That thing between my upper jaw and my lower jaw, that thing that rests down there between that circle of my lower jaw, James says, Kendall, no man has ever tamed it. How, many, how long has it been since you walked up to a mirror and stuck that thing out and said you've got within those two jaws something that no man has ever tamed, something in there that's curious and fierce and ferocious, something that's terrible. The reason why people get caught in these sins of the tongue so often it's because they can't realize that dangerous thing within their mouth. They never, they never look at the thing. They never take it out before God. They never examine this thing in the light of God's divine truth. They never let God declare to it what this thing is and what it's composed and what force it is. Untamed. It's fierce. Yes, sir. Like wild animals. Oh, my God. You realize in your jaws this morning is a thing worse than wild animals and wild, fierce beasts. You've tamed them. If you've ever been around where they're taming animals and been in those places there when they bring them in, in their cages, and they start to break them in, they tame them there, they break them in, and they switch that old tail, they claw the ground, and they roll and foam runs from their mouth, and their eyes are like fire, but they keep on dealing and keep on putting through the school and breaking that wheel and conquering that determination until finally they turn that thing loose and they walk in there into that cage with it with a whip and a cap gun in the other hand. They break that thing. They'll snap that thing, and that thing will cow back. Then they'll crack that gun a time or two, and it'll tremble. Get up there! And they'll drive that thing to obey. And they can put that thing on and make it climb stairs and sit on stools. That thing, if it would want to turn loose, there's no man in this universe that could conquer that thing or hold that thing. But it doesn't know its power. It doesn't know its force. We tame animals and conquer animals. But this thing in your jaw, no man has ever tamed the thing. 
You ever watch them conquer one of those outlaw horses of the West? Outlaws. Not just an ordinary farm horse, a perching, or some of these other around here that are not too hard to conquer, but an outlaw that's been born out there and grown up out there in the wild and has known no master. Brother, when they run that thing into a chute and finally out there and that thing down into a crowd and shut the door, that thing breaks out in sweat and foam all over its body and its nervousness and tenseness. Its eyes are fiery. Its nostrils are expanding. It comes at you striking with both feet as it comes ready to kill you. But a man has known how to jump back, crowds him in and shoves the gate against it and finally hobbles that horse then pulls that gate loose. And that horse makes a lunge, but he's hobbled with both hind legs and he can't hurt himself. And down to the ground he goes and the man falls on his head and brings him down. And after he's conquered that wheel until that horse realizes he's conquered, he'll put a saddle on him, get him used to the saddle, finally put one foot in the stirrup and swing his leg over and ride that horse and make it become an instrument. But the tongue has no man tamed. A wild outlaw horse is nothing compared to this thing in your mouth this morning. He said the ship out there, driven by fierce winds, riding out those storms, riding out those white caps going down in those crawls, riding the breakers out there, creaking and tossing and reeling. And yet a man standing up there just guides that thing, steers her across. But in your mouth is that thing called the tongue that no man can tame. Oh, my God. Tears. But who's afraid of it? Who draws back? Who keeps his mouth as with lock and key lest Satan gain the advantage? and cause me to speak unadvisedly and illicitly with my mouth. He that would see long life and no good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. You've probably got a short life ahead of you, gossiper and backbiter, troublemaker. You probably will not live out half your days. Probably won't. God, has promised long life to those who know how, know the secret of having a tongue that's conquered and controlled and disciplined and sanctified under the sanctifying grace of God. Oh, I could stand here and illustrate this time and time again through animal life and through life out there, but I think we're thinking together. But he goes a little farther and says, it's ferocious. It's like a fire. Oh, how long has it been since you walked up to the mirror and stuck it out and said, that thing is a flame of fire. It's set on fire of hell if it's not sanctified. And it sets on fire the wheels of nature. Yes, sir. Why? Have you really talked to yourself about your tongue? Have you really dealt with yourself over this thing? Are you frightened? Do you live trembling? Do you live weak? Do you live fearful of how many times you've spoken unadvised with the lips? How many times you've said things you shouldn't have said? How many times you've told things that weren't exactly the truth? You went back of how many times you've had to go back and say, forgive me, I'm sorry. Oh, and yet today you've never dealt with this thing or brought this thing down to God to let him deal with it and give you the kind of a tongue he has for you. Light, frivolous, foolish, silly individuals. Don't take the warning of God. The great Chicago fire back there in the yesterdays was started. So history tells us by a woman out milking it. A cow kicked her over kicked the belt bucket over and kicked the lantern over. And while she was trying to get up and straighten herself and get away from the cow that was kicking, the lantern caught the straw on fire and the straw swept out through there and caused the great Chicago fire. Millions of dollars of damage. People homeless, destruction. You walk through and look at the plunder and the charred buildings and the standing walls. The people out there without homes, everything gone. 
God says this thing in our mouths is just like that. It's a flame of fire set on fire of hell. Careless words, sensuous words, critical words, spoken. And there they go, like flames of fire. No way to stop it. Have you ever driven down through the countryside mile after mile maybe and looked out there, trunks of trees, little limbs hanging out just the bottom next to the tree, undergrowth all gone. There they are killed and slain and charred and burned. Erosion has taken its effect. The freezes and the thaws and the storms and the winters and big gulches and gullies are cut and you look at it and say, an unsightly mess. Oh, what a picture. Great God, can't you do something with it? That's a horrible thing, what started. A little careless fire along the road that wasn't put out. The flip of a cigarette out there that wasn't snuffed out. A lighted match that was thrown out there. And unbeknown and unseen, it found a little timber and it found a little kindling wood and it found a little dry grass. And the first thing you know, the whole forest, the hillsides, the mountainsides, the whole community, and families fleeing and homes being destroyed. Everything in this path being torn down and burned to shreds. Yes, sir. Had you ever looked at your words and thought the effect of them? Fire. Fire. Oh, my God. Fierce. Oh, how they are. What are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about these things. And let me bring them down to a practical application right here. Family splits, family trouble, brothers not speaking to brothers and sisters not speaking to sisters, mother-in-laws and father-in-laws not speaking to their daughter-in-laws and son-in-laws, grandchildren never allowed to go on the outs, yet sitting in the same church. Families of the church crossed out and split up. Won't sit on the same side. If one, if one side wants the preacher, the other side don't want them. One side wants the advantage, the other side don't want them. One side feels like they ought to do something, the other side. Why? Only reason they're against it is because they're crossed up in their spirits. They're not praying about it. They're not minding. Who's it wrong? Both sides if they're fighting. Amen. Amen. Fears. Fears. Until finally, that church is split, and they go down the road and start up another little one, and they both just struggle along. Just struggle along. And the community suffers, and the community is shocked. And they said, we just never dreamed that crowd would do that. No community loses confidence in the church till the church loses confidence in herself. And the church is bound to have lost confidence in herself and confidence in her people to get into wrangling and fussing and divisions and strife and contentions and bickerings and backbitings. For if you bite and devour one another, take heed lest you be consumed one of another. Yes, sir. And it won't be long till the church will be closed and the community suffers. There's no witness there. Oh, couldn't realize it was set on fire of hell. Just couldn't realize it. Couldn't imagine it. What the enemy was leading us out to and what he was getting us into and how he was snaring us and trapping us. You remember when you burned out here in your tabernacle, old Stoneborough camp a few years back? You remember that? You remember how Brother Van Warmer and Brother Robertson and the rest of them made the issue and said, we'll have to have a tabernacle? God has permitted we don't understand it, but God's permitted we have so much insurance and now we'll have to have so much money. And it drew Allegheny Conference together and they rallied together and we have this very lovely tabernacle today. Wasn't this unity and discord? One person wanted to build someplace else and one person wanted to build someplace else. No, sir. God, your will be done. Get the best building for the best price you can get. Brother Van Warman, Brother Robertson, 
Brother Marquis and the rest of them, get the best you can get. Get the one that's suitable. Get the one that'll meet the needs of Allegheny Conference. Get the ones where our children and our young people and our friends and the Sunday school crowds and the backsliders of our community can come together for the annual camp and for the conference and for the youth convention. Get what we need and they rally together. But there's another kind of fire that burns, that fire that severs, that fire that sears, that fire that's just as dangerous and wreaks as much havoc, if not more, than the physical fire that destroyed our old tabernacle. What if today somebody even in this service would say, fire, fire, fire in the dormitories, fire over here in the cottages. Well, we dismiss, you know that. We don't need me to try to preach or anybody else try to preach. Somebody's clothes, somebody's at stake, maybe a baby's in there. The buildings are there. The investment we've made, there they are. And we'd rally to it. But oh, let me bring this down. And God, give me a heartbreak right here. What about in a few years when the tabernacle is partly empty and people say, I haven't seen brother so-and-so here for a long time. No, he don't come anymore. And I haven't seen that family here for a long time. No, they don't come anymore. And for sale sign goes up on this cottage, and a for sale sign goes up on that one, and a for sale sign goes up on that one, and a for sale sign goes up on another one. And the fire of criticism and suspicion and surmising and gossip and backbiting and evil speaking has crushed and caught and bruised and mangled and torn and severed and were being consumed. Do I realize the danger there is in this thing within our hearts? Do I realize? Hear me this morning. The liberal crowd would rejoice in glee. That crowd that's lowered the standards and compromised their convictions and would drag any church down and would subtly undermine and deteriorate and destroy and turn our beloved church into nothing but a worldly affair bow down, embrace everything, even embrace Calvinism and embrace the whole thing. That church out there would say, see, there they are with their strictness and their straightness. Look, they couldn't even get along with themselves. Couldn't even get along with themselves. And the devil would rejoice and gloat in glee. Yes, sir. It's up to you and I to see that this thing within our jaws, this thing that sets on fire the course of nature, this thing that wreaks havoc and destroys and plunders and kills and is worse than wild animals and worse than any flame of fire, this thing within our jaws, God has a cure for this thing to bring it out to where we can be united and seek the will of God and find the will of God and live in the will of God regardless of what our opinions are or our desires are. Who is Paul? Who is Cephas? Who is Apollos? Christ is all. I can serve under Brother Brand Warmer as president. I write him off and tell him, oh, I can serve under Tom Shuttleworth as president. Oh, I can serve under Jack Van. It don't make any difference to me. I don't have any itch to be president. If they're minding God and leading the conference down the ways of old-fashioned rugged holders and staying true to the standards of the cross and endeavoring to have Holy Ghost camp, I can serve under any of them. Christ is all in all. But where is our strife and division and contention? Are ye not carnal and walk as men? Are you with me on this? Yes. Let a man examine himself, whether he be in the faith. What's he talking about? For some come and eat here and some come with this. I don't have time to go into that. I'm just using it here to try to make this point a little plainer, drive it a little closer home until there'll be a little more fear in our hearts. Now we'll draw near to God and seek the cleansing baptism. He's speaking here of that crowd that goes to the communion table, the Lord's table, with sin in her heart, hatred, wrath, divisions, strife, surmising, suspicions, 
criticisms. He said, you shall eat and drink judgment, damnation to your own soul. Why? Hear it. Judgment. Because of this, many are weak and many are sickly and many are already asleep. Judgment. Yes, sir. Oh, Paul severe on this and God severe in dealing with this thing of the tongue. Oh, one of the worst feuds we ever had in the Kentucky mountains was started by two women in one of our towns down in the Kentucky mountains. They got down there and the children was with them and they were talking like a lot of people do sitting around on one of those benches. A lot of people haven't got anything more to do than sit around on the benches. They go to Hope Sound to sit around on the benches or sit around on the beach. They come to Stonebird to sit around. Wherever they go, they just sit around. About every other night, you can find them out some auction sale or some kind of a party or picnic or social. Yes, sir. Or some kind of a shower. Some churches are showered to death. No wonder they never get a downpour. All they have showers, going away parties and come together parties and bridal parties and uh, set up housekeeping parties. Why? It's all it is. It's just shower, 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 shower. No wonder they're not deeply spiritual. Sit around, talk and laugh and joke and play little silly games and carry on nonsense. But what was said out there at those places? How many of those places have you been to and if you're really honest, you didn't come away and feel like your garments were sullied and spotted and soiled? How many have walked out of one of those places and felt like you was a pure, clean, unspotted, unsullied, unwrinkled, untarnished, untainted bride of Christ yet? reason why we're no more spiritual than what we are. We're just too light and too loose and too frivolous. We like to hear too much gossip. We like to know too much about what's going on. Everybody in the town, everyone is living a double life and everything else. Amen. And they were talking. And one of the children overheard. And immediately within its heart, it said, my dad don't know that. If my dad knew that. And that child couldn't wait to get home. Why did you tell somebody something? Was it to make them more holy and more spiritual and more godlike and make them have more confidence in somebody? Was that the reason why you told them? Or did you know the reason why you was telling them? I'll see how they react. If they knew this, they'll be on my side and they'll turn against that other fellow. Of course, we're saved and sanctified, preacher, though we act like this and talk like this. And though these are the incentives and the motives in our heart, we're still saved and sanctified. By what book? By what spirit? On what authority? You won't get up and testify to the witness of the Holy Ghost in your heart after you've talked like that and know those are the motives back of it. I'll tell you one thing. You'll come down to die with no faith if you die with that in your heart. You'll come down to die and realize the clouds and the shadows are across the horizon of your life and Christ has turned his back on you. He slipped home, said, Dad, Dad, you know what Mrs. So-and-so told Mom? He said, No, what did she tell? And that boy sat there and told it, and he didn't get it exactly right. Are you sure what you told you got exactly right? Are you sure you didn't add a thing to it? What would you call that but lying? And don't you know every liar shall have his part in the lake of fire? And not only liars, but whatsoever maketh a lie, or whatsoever is a bomb nation. And one who soweth discord is the bomb nation to God. How can you be a Christian, be saved and sanctified, and also be an abomination to God by God's Word? Something's got to lie. Something's got to be wrong. You think God's wrong? You think God's book lies? Do you think God could be, do you think a man or woman could be a part of the bride of Christ and also an abomination in God's sight? Do you think the Holy Ghost would put his seal in his witness and his sanction and preserve you in wholeness when God says you're abominable? Let's face the truth. Sister Bloom preached so graciously and masterfully yesterday morning. He said, did she say that? The boy said, yes, she did. He just walked over, got a hold of the bell, and rang that old bell back there in those mountains. And the boys came in the field, said, well, dinner's not ready yet. He said, no, sir, get your guns. They said, what's wrong, Dad? He said, that man over there, you know, they said, and they called him a name, said, yes, sir. And he told them what they said, and their fire flew in their eyes. Brother, now along those pathways and along those roads, bodies dropped. Men died. 
Children died. School, children went to school and fought. Children met on the streets of town and fought. Men fought in the streets of the villages and blood ran and faces were bruised and bodies and shot down, knifed and cut to pieces. Houses were plundered and window panes shot out and homes set on fire. What are you talking about, preacher? This thing within our mouth, one little careless, critical, sensuous word, one little bit of suspicion, one little bit of anger or hate or malice or strife in our heart, and we tell something, brother, there's no way to stop the thing. Oh. And how you'd like to rectify it out there in the tomorrows. I think of a little family, just a husband and a wife, and they live with his mother and father, all professors of religion. And that mother and that father and that husband made that little wife as miserable and as wretched. Oh, how cruel the tongue. How hard the beatings you can give somebody the tongue. How sharp the arrows. Jeremiah said, you wet your tongue as bows as arrows. The brother supplanteth brother, and you shoot at your tongue like arrows for lies. A few years rolled by. That little girl's eyes were sunk back, dark circles under her eyes. She was laboring, striving, seeking, and bearing it all. And one morning, her mother-in-law had been fussing at her and raging at her, her husband had walked off of the porch and refused to kiss her goodbye and say goodbye to her. And she went back in the house heartbroken. And she was baking that morning and she lit the oven on the gas stove and at least she thought she lit it. And she shut the door and she went on to get her stuff ready for the oven and she came back and pulled it down and saw that the heat wasn't up and she looked in and in her tears and sobs and heart cry, in the brokenness of her spirit, as she was being made a slave, she evidently didn't leave the door down long enough to get the gas out, and she struck it on the match. It stuck it in and went, boom, and caught her on fire. Burned her clothes and burned her hair and face. She just kind of dropped in the floor. Finally, her mother-in-law came down and said, you crazy thing, didn't you know better than that? And lambasted and ridiculed and let her lay there in her burns and her suffering. Finally, after a while, she went to the phone, called up her husband, said, you better come home. Marge is burned. He said, very bad. She said, pretty bad. He said, well, Mom, call the doctor in the ambulance. And she said, I'm not going to do it. Said she ought to have better sense than that. How do you act toward people? How kind are you? Is the law of kindness in your tongue? Is your conversation seasoned with grace? Is it edifying to the hearer? A soft answer turneth away wrath. He rushed home, saw the condition there laying on the floor, and said, Why, Mom? And finally got her in a sheet, and the ambulance came, and they slipped her off to the hospital. And that evening he was sitting by her bed, and he said to her, Marge, You think you'll make it? She said, No, I'm not going to make it. He said, You're not going to make it? She said, No. She said, I'm sorry I so miserably failed. He said, what do you mean? She said, I'm sorry I failed to be any better witness for Christ than what I've been. I'm sorry I failed to be a fuller witness and a greater witness and a greater demonstration of his grace and his love and his mercy and his long suffering and his kindness. Why, he said, nobody could have lived any more like Christ in our home and you. But she said, I never did win you. I never did win my husband nor I didn't win my mother-in-law or my father. He said he sat there through the hours of the night with a broken heart. And I wouldn't be surprised there won't be some people around Allegheny Conference who will look back in the years to come at broken hearts, wish you could get back and amend things and straighten up things. Yes, sir. But it'll be too late. He said about one o'clock in the morning the nurse came in and tapped me on the shoulder and said to me, I believe she's dying. He said, do you think so? She said, I think she is. And he said, I just got over the bed and got down close to her. And I said, Marge, I did love you. I did love you. But I had a poor way of showing it. I let mom and dad influence me. Marge, I did love you. She said, well, why didn't you tell me one of us living? He 
He said, I leaned over and pressed my lips to hers, but she was too far gone to return the kiss. Wonder what it's going to take around the Allegheny Conference to wake us up and bring us to our senses and unite us together that the enemy doesn't gain the advantage and that we're not crippling and bruising and beating and driving and separating and severing and destroy the very thing for which we've labored, for which we've laid out our life and which our forefathers and our mothers and dads have handed down to us through the years to come. Oh, I wonder who I'm speaking to even in this size crowd this morning. Out yonder when you hear somebody's sick unto death, you'll say, I better get to them. Out there when you hear somebody's a cancer victim, you'll say, I better get to them. Out there when you hear somebody's dead, you'll slip around and want to send some flowers. Oh, too late then. Too late then. But it's not only an untamed tongue, it's an unhallowed tongue, James tells us. An unhallowed tongue. Oh, therewith bless we God and curse man who is made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. Why are you talking about preacher? Shouting in Allegheny Conference camp, coming around the altar and praying, getting up and testifying, standing out in the ring meeting and praising God, saying you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, kneeling down on your knees and come to early morning prayer meeting. But in your heart, in your heart, there's enmity and enmity and strife and contention and bickering and backbiting and string pulling and scheming and politicking and conniving and knifing one another in the back. Will you be honest? Will you put your hand on your heart this morning and raise your right hand to heaven and say you've talked about no one who wasn't in your presence to injure them or hurt their reputation in any way to anyone else but what you've made it right? A lot of people say to me, Kendall, you're just not too sociable. I can give you the answer right quickly publicly for that. I'm afraid to be too sociable. There's not very many crowds of preachers you can get in today, beloved. It won't be long till they'll be talking about somebody else. There's not very many gatherings of preachers' wise you can get in or evangelists' wise. What very long they're talking about somebody, running them down, belittling them, criticizing them, gossiping. I was at a pastor, and I won't mention where it was. It might be too close home. I went up to my room, tap came on the door, and pastor said, can I come in? I said, sure. He said, Kendall, I want to talk to me. And I said, certainly. I'm always ready for somebody to talk to me. I'm, I'm always ready to try to find some teaching from somebody. There's no, there's no black person. There's no yellow person. There's no red person. There's no person out there illiterate and dumb. There's not a person that I don't feel like God can use as a teacher to help this poor, stumbling, blundering boy. He said, Kendall, what do you know about my church? I said, sir, I don't know a thing. He said, do you mean that? I said, I mean it. Preachers, before they go to the congregations, they've talked to the former pastors and the wives have talked to the former pastors' wives and they know all the time. Listen to me, preachers. It'll influence your ministry. It'll have an influence on your fellowship and communion. It'll have an influence on your prayer life. It'll have an influence upon you. He said the last evangelist that came here, he said he knew more about my church than I did. I'm not running preacher's wives down, but I'm saying, hear me, a lot of preacher's wives are guilty of gathering all this stuff, going back to the room and back out there to home and spreading it all and stuffing it in their husband's ears. It's an unhallowed tongue sing and shout and lead song service and preach messages and pray around the altar and act like you're concerned about it and in your heart have suspicion and strife and contention and criticism. God help us. Amen. Amen. Would you dare say this morning you're not living a double life on this line? An unhallowed tongue. Can a fig tree bring forth olive berries? 
Can a vine bring forth figs? Can a fountain send forth bitter and sweet water to the same place? It's an impossibility. It's an impossibility. It's an impossibility for you and I to have divine love in our heart and have hatred and malice and unforgiveness and suspicion and surmising and strife and contention. It's impossible for you and I to love our brother and at the same time turn around behind his back and stab him and cut him and harm him and injure him and run him down and lower his character. It's an impossibility. It's an impossibility for you to be a saved and sanctified child of God and at the same time a gossiper and a backbiter and a whisperer. Amen. I believe God's Word, don't you? Sure do. It's unhallowed. It has double talk. Now, right, here comes the preacher over to visit some of you laymen. Well, here comes the preacher and his wife again. I tell you, don't ever visit anybody else. It looks like they're always visiting us. And just about mealtime again. They've been over here just about mealtime for the last three or four times. They know we'll always invite them. They eat off of us and then they save theirs. But here they come. They didn't know anything about that conversation going in between mother and the children, you know. And the preacher comes, Oh, we're so happy to see you. My, you're always welcome here. We're so glad to have you. We want you to make this our home. And it's just about mealtime. Don't say you won't stay. We're just happy to have you. We've got a plenty. And you've just got to stay and eat with us. Now, of course, that couldn't be lying, could it? No, that couldn't be lying in a professor of religion in the Western Methodist Church. That couldn't be hypocrisy. Oh, no. No. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you just straight out what you are? Or are you one of these cover-uppers, so to speak? My father, back on the farm, when I was learning to plow just as a young boy, there was one thing he detested, to cut and cover. You know what I mean by cut and cover, and some of you farmers do anyway. You leave a little strip, you know, you don't cut loose. And then all the way down through those furrows, there's your grass and your weeds coming up. Yes, sir. My dad would say, Stanley, don't you dare do it. You make that plow cut everything away, don't you dare cut and cover. But a lot of professed Christians like to cut and cover. Yes, sir. They got more covered up than what they got cut loose, too. Amen. Oh. Here comes Sister so and so yeah, here she comes. You know the next door neighbor, maybe. My. She just comes and sits and talks and talks. And don't she ever have anything to do? My, it looks like she'd have something to do with her family, but she don't. She just comes. And you can't run off and leave her. And then she wants a cup of coffee, and you have to sit down and drink coffee with her. I wish she'd stay home. But when you meet her at the door, oh, oh, you're the best neighbor I ever had. Yes. Your visits are always so encouraging and helpful to me. Yes, sir. I guess I don't get to make it over to your house very much. I've got something. But you just come any time you want to. Amen. An unhallowed tongue. Double talk. Flattery. Put on. Lie. And it may be that fella that lives next door to some of you lay men. You know that like to bar things and when they bring it back, the lawnmower's out of gas, you know, and the blade's dull and they bring back your pliers and they won't work. They've been sprung out of and they bring back the saw and it's been sawed into a nail. And you see him drive up out in front. Or you see him walk down the street. Here he comes. I wonder what he wants to bar now. I have a good notion to tell him I'm busy. I'm going to use the thing. I wish I knew what he wanted to borrow. I'd certainly tell him I was going to use it. Yeah, sit right there and plan a lie. But he comes around, you know, and he said, it looks like I just have to kind of impose on you. Oh, that don't matter. My, my. I'm just, because you're not imposing on me. I'm glad I got something for you to use. Sure. I want to be a good neighbor. Amen. An unhallowed tongue. Oh. Unhallowed in its lightness and frivolity and foolishness and nonsense. Here we are praying. Here we are pleading with God for souls. Here we are asking God to visit us, to give us the Holy Ghost camp. 
not much more than get off the grounds or get in your cottage until this light, foolish, frivolous nonsense. Yes, sir. Slapping one another and joking one another and spinning puns and mocking Kendall and mocking Bess and mocking Sister Blue and mocking Van Warmer and mocking them all. All a bunch of hilarity. Who would dare say you'd just been over to early morning prayer meeting asking God to visit us? Who would dare say that you was concerned had a burden for souls? I think of a young man back in our conference some time back. He seemed to be a promising young preacher. And they, he was sent to a charge, a single boy. And he moved into that charge, and God, it looked like, was using him. He had a personality and talent and ability. And one of the young men of the neighborhood that the church had been praying for for years that started attending said, Oh, I like that young man. I appreciate him. He began to move from the back of the church toward the middle and up toward the front. And everybody was saying, He'll soon be in, no doubt. God's dealing with him. God's dealing with him. And then on Sunday, the young man and the preacher were both invited over to one of the homes where there were young ladies and where there was young people, where there was a crowd. And they ate their lunch. And then the lightness, the foolishness, the nonsense, the fondling over one another, the silliness, the froth of his life. And the young man sat there and watched it all. And he said, if that's all it is, if he's serious and solemn in the pulpit, if he wants to deal with me about my soul, if he's concerned about souls, and then can get out here and throw himself loose in just revelry and fun and nonsense and stillness with a service coming up tonight. And the young man walked out of that home and never darkened the church door, never darkened the church door again. A few years later, he was laying out there in old Kentucky dying, and that young man was still pastoring. He was married then. And some of the people said, why don't you go and visit Harry? He said, I've tried to talk to him, but he said, he just kind of brushes me off. Well, they said, he's dying yonder in the hospital. And the pastor made his way there, found the room number, walked up to the room, walked into the room, looked down on Harry's face, and Harry, he said, Harry, don't you think you better do something about your soul? He said, preacher, there's no need to talk to me. And the preacher said, why? He said, do you remember when you first came? how I began to move and God was dealing with my heart. He said, I sure do. What happened? He said, that day when you was light and frivolous and foolish, had no seeming discipline of your life, nor of your manners, nor of your talk, nor your conversation out there when you carried on like that. He said, I said, there's nothing to it. I hardened my heart. I sealed it and said, I want nothing more to do with it. And he said, God, give me up. wonder how many people of being held because they've been a close friend of yours. I wonder how many people nobody can ever reach. No gospel power can ever get to them. The Holy Ghost can never awaken them. No revival ever reach them and no camp will ever reach them. They've been a close associate of yours. And you've been light and frivolous and foolish in senses. You've been gossiping and backbiting and string pulling. You've told them this and told them that. And you've run this and down, run that and down. You've belittled this. You've told them all the trouble and all the strife and all the contentions and every fault everybody else has got. Because they've been a close companion of yours. Because they've associated with you. Because they've fellowshiped you. Because you've been their friend. You've damned them in hell forever. While you professed and went on. Have you ever stopped to think of the people that's already across the great divide that may be in hell because of the way you lived and me because of the way I lived out there. And they never got established. They never got settled. They never were deeply spiritual. They never got their feet down. They never knew what it was to have a sanctified experience. Oh, unhallowed. But it's not only an unhallowed. He says it's an unwise tongue. And he gives those two great descriptions of wisdom from beneath and wisdom from above. Devilish and sensuous and full of every evil work. Yes, sir. You and I can know where we are if we will. But that wisdom from above is first pure, peaceable, easy to be entreated. Yes, sir. Without partiality, without hypocrisy, full of mercy and full of good works. 
for the work of righteousness is sown in peace. Thank God. An unwise tongue. Oh, that tongue that asks hasty questions and gives hasty answers, just always, always speaking, always talking. You know, my, some people, it just looks like they, they can't settle down and be still. You can mark this down. A loose-talking person is most generally a shallow-living person. Yes, sir. Unwise. Oh. It's a hasty, argumentative tongue a lot of times. Always ready to argue. Always ready to debate. Always ready to wrangle. Always carrying your feelings around, so to speak, on your elbows and on the outside. Always arguing your point. You don't have to be arguing your point. You don't have to be defending the truth. No, sir. Just let the truth go out. Just stand in the will of God. Just let God have right away in your life. Yes, sir. It's an unwise tongue. Oh. It's an unescapable truth. I either have a sanctified tongue or I have an unsanctified tongue. I either have a tongue that's sowing discord or that's sowing peace. I either have a tongue that's heavenly or a tongue that's hellish. My tongue is either controlled by heaven and the grace of God and the sanctifying power of the Spirit, and I speak as a heavenly-minded man having the mind of Christ. Seasoned with salt and grace, edifying to the hearers, pouring all on troubled waters, bringing the glorious gospel of peace, or I am controlled and dominated and ruled by the powers of hell. And my words can be cutting and harsh and critical and sour and bitter and cantankerous and stirring up strife and setting fire. I've got to have one of the two. Got to have one of the two. No way around it. No way around it. No, sir. Let me illustrate what I mean by this and try to drive this thing to a close. A father came in one evening. His boys were eating and they were fussing about the meal and they were finding fault and criticizing. Mom was sitting at the table with her apron up, dabbing the tears from her eyes. Finally, she got up and said, Excuse me, I, I can't eat anymore. Dad sat down with the boys and watched them eat. Finally, he got up himself. He said, boys, I just can't eat. He walked in the room and came back out, and he had a hammer in one hand, and he had a butcher knife in another. They said, well, Dad, what are you going to do? He said, I want to give these to you boys. Well, they said, what do we want to do with these? He said, I want you to go upstairs to your mother. She's up there on her knees praying, I'm sure. I want you to go up there and stab her to death and beat her brains out. Until she's dead. Oh, they said, Why, well, Dad, Dad, a murderer. He said, That's what you're doing with your tongue and your fussing and your quarreling and your fault finding. Oh, you wouldn't take a knife. You wouldn't take a hammer and bludgeon someone to death. You wouldn't stab someone like Specs did those girls. You wouldn't do that. That would make you shudder. But this little thing closed in your mouth. Call the tongue, set on fire of hell, is murdered and lacerated and cut and bludgeoned and killed and bruised and beaten out there until they're dying today, shambles and shackled out there and torn to shreds along the highway of life. It's an unescapable truth. God knows. God understands. Oh. But God gives a cure. Finally, brethren, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any praise and any virtue, think on these. The way to bring yourself into a disciplined life is in the power of the Holy Ghost until it puts you in the realm to where you think on these realms of the elevation of the heavenly world. And you don't sit around and let somebody spew in your ears nor tell you things. No, you don't sit around and hang. What do you talk about mostly now when you're around with the crowd? 
Do you talk on heavenly things and spiritual things and what you've been delivered from and the divine will of God and the graces of God and the riches and the inheritance? Do you talk on this or something else occupying most of your talking and conversation these days? Be ye filled with the Spirit. Yes, sir. That's God's divine cure. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in, the, in your heart, and giving thanks unto God always in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. There's the cure for evil speaking. There's the cure for the sins of the tongue. God's placed it right there. He's a wise father. There's no one of us that has any children. When Brother Blair was rearing his boys, and he saw them out there maybe with an ice pick, or he saw them out there with something that was dangerous, he didn't run up to them, grab them, and slap them. Why, well, I know if he'd have done it, they'd have probably jammed in their eye, or jammed in their leg, or stuck it into their stomach, and been a dead person. No, he didn't. He said, and I'm sure Bill wouldn't mind, or Don and the rest of them, he said, Bill, Bill, look here, Daddy. Watch Daddy now. Now, Bill, Bill, look here. And he picks up something, and all the while, what's he trying to do? Get that thing out of his hand. That he's going to destroy himself, wouldn't injure himself. And finally, he gets over to him. To, he can take a hold of his arm and get that out and say, Now, here, take this. That's what God, the wise, infinite, loving Father, sees we're going to destroy herself and damn herself with an unholy tongue, an unhallowed tongue, an untamed tongue, an unwise tongue, and that God can't excuse it, that we're digging her own grave with her tongue and soon send ourselves into the fires of an eternal hell. And God, in His infinite mercy, through Jesus Christ, to cross our pathway, He said, here it is. Here it is. When He was reviled, He reviled not again. When He was persecuted, He answered not. There was no guile in His mouth. He just suffered it. He just suffered it. Thank God. Thank God. I wonder how much you're in my life resembles and typifies and exalts and glorifies and manifests that Spirit of Christ. Has the Holy Ghost been able to substitute in my life for that sensuous, unbridled, untamed, unholy tongue, the tongue of the heavenly Christ, the tongue of a heavenly-minded man? Oh, I believe this, that a thousand or a million or ten million or a hundred million saints of God that are saved and sanctified could live under one roof and there wouldn't be any fussing and fighting and quarreling. I'm not saying they'd see everything exactly alike, but there'd be no disunion or no disharmony or no discord or fussing or criticism. You believe that? Yeah. If that's not so, then heaven will not be heaven. When do you expect to get delivered from this carnal nature? When do you expect to get delivered from this anger and wrath and malice and strife? When do you expect to get cleansed? Well, after you don't believe in antinomianism and Calvinism. You don't believe in purgatory, surely. I believe a man's going to get sanctified holy and be ready for heaven. He's going to have to do it now while he's alive in this body. And if God can't do it now, there's no place he can do it. I believe it. No need to make an excuse for it. No need to make an alibi around it. No, sir. I haven't allowed the Holy Ghost to fill me with the Spirit and to put into me the sweetness and the tenderness and the Spirit of Christ. Oh, pray for me. I want to gather this in quickly here. For God to take this truth in the finality of it and apply it any way that He wishes to. You say, preacher... I don't believe anybody lives like that. You know the reason why you believe that? You don't really believe it. You want to believe it. You're trying to make yourself believe it because you know you're not living here and if you think somebody else is living there, it puts you under condemnation. As long as you can hang around with that gossip and backbiting, string pulling, criticizing crowd and play like Absalom out there and be a schemer and a plotter and a conniver and turn the hearts of people away from this and even go so far as to say, well, I just wouldn't let that fellow even get in my pulpit. Well, now, if he's an adulterer, or if he's a whoremonger, or if he needs to be brought before the Judiciary Committee, then why don't you do it in the proper channels? Instead of getting out there with your little crowd and your little scheming outfit and boasting yourself and patting him out, I'll tell him right to his face, but you never have told him. 
If he's that kind of an individual, and belongs before the Judiciary Committee. And if he don't belong before the Judiciary Committee, then you're out of place, and you're taking the place of God and the Holy Ghost and judging and lambasting it. But the whole thing of it is, there's envy and jealousy and strife in your heart, and you're not willing to let God bring you down and bring you in, and God's will be carried out. You've got a will of your own, and you're not subject to the law of God. And this thing within you is rising up in fire, and that fire is trying to do everything to sever and destroy and deteriorate and demolish and to bring apart. And God's trying to unite us. Back in our own country, maybe, have you ever been at Calisco camp over in Kentucky? One of the great old camps, one of the great old preachers that preached down through the years. Dan Taylor, a man who had a great influence on my life when God was beginning to deal with me. A man that had cost him everything he had to go with God. That's a trouble too many people. Brother, we've never gone to the bottom in repentance. It's never cost us much. It's never cost us real sacrifice nor self-denial. It's never cost us the ostracism and the isolation. It's never cost us a severance run. We're just going along living like little uh, cupid dolls, you might say, like little baby petted men. There we are. It cost him. Brother Tilly just labored by the day to make a living, keep bread on his table and clothes on his back, save up for a little fuel for the winter and buy books for his children and clothes for the winter for his children to wear to school. One day he was working away out there. He wouldn't work in the tobacco crop. Back in Kentucky and in some of our other states, one of the big battles that we have, and of course we've rounded the corners now, you know. We can raise tobacco and smoke tobacco and dip snuff and sell tobacco, anything. Nothing's wrong now. Just so you give us your money. Brother, we're running, we're running the church now with money and program, not with the Holy Ghost and the power of God. Watch them. Watch this crowd that professes everything in the book and claims to be the most spiritual. Of watch them. The whole thing is money and organization and encourage this and encourage that and play to the and preach on the glory side. Brother, well, they're going down the two number two. That's exactly the road they're going. Working along one day, God spoke to him and said, Dan Taylor, I want a camp meeting out here. And Dan Taylor said, praise God. It's all right with me, Lord. He said, but I want you to build it. And Dan Taylor said, I don't have any money. He said, you don't have to have any money. You see what I mean, don't you? Today we've got to have money and fine buildings and a program and cultured and trained Sunday school teachers and refined. I'm not running these down, but I'm saying all of these has proven to us it's not going to bring revival. We're going down the tune of this thing and we're being brainwashed. God said, I want it. He gave him a place. He said, well, God, the man that owns that is a wholeness fighter. He hates God's way of wholeness. He hates the truth. He's a wicked, vile man. He said, I'll deal with that man. He said, I said to him, how can I buy that piece of ground? That's the value of a piece of ground. He said, Dan Taylor, how much money you got? He said, I've got, I believe it was 60 some dollars saved up. And that was money back in those days. He said, I've got to save up for clothes and for fuel and for my taxes for the year. God said, take it and buy that piece of ground for me. Oh, we'll go in debt for everything else, but not for God. You know, you get around the missionary meeting. Well, you just caught me when I was broke. Don't talk about that. You got money saved up for your vacation. You got money saved up to remodel your house. But take the missionary off and missionary pledges and you'll sit right there and say you're broke. Dan Taylor walked out of his garden, I believe it was, he's working in. Went over across the countryside to that man. The man saw him come and said, What's the matter, Dan? You're hard up against it? No, Dan said, I'm not. He said, What do you want now? He said, I want to buy a piece of ground. Why, he said, Dan Taylor, you couldn't buy a square inch of ground. You poor, poverty-stricken fella. You just barely keep them clothes on the back of your children and food on the table. He said, I know it's all true. But he said, having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Would you say you know this in your heart? Are you always itching for something else, never satisfied? He said, Dan, what do you want with a piece of ground? He said, to build a camp meeting on. He said, Dan, who told you to do this? He said, God. He said, Dan, where did God tell you wanted it? And Dan Taylor said, that man was shaking. He said, right out here on the road, he'd give him this description there of the of the property there. 
at Beach Woods? He said, that's one of the best pieces of land I've got, Dan. He said, I know it. And he said, it's got good timber on it. He said, I know it. And God knows it. We've got to build a tabernacle. We've got to build some other buildings on that. We need it. He said, Dan, did God really tell you to do this? He said, yes, sir. God told me to do it. He said, Dan, tell her how much money you got. And Dan told him 60-some dollars. Why, he said, Dan Taylor, that wasn't much more than draw up and take care of the legal things. He said, I know it, but God told me to come over here and buy this land from you. That man said, meet me at Bedford, Bedford, Kentucky, tomorrow morning. Dan Taylor said, I'll be there. Said, we walked together into the courthouse. Said, we went into the lawyer's office. And he said, draw Dan Taylor up a piece of ground. He said, I had it surveyed yesterday afternoon. He said, I'm giving him 10 acres out there. He said, how do you want this made, Dan Taylor? Who do you want to deed it to he said, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The lawyer said, never heard of such thing. He said, that's who I want to deed it to. It's not man's. We wouldn't be in so much trouble either. Perhaps if we'd have minded God back there and had God in the past. Amen. There's a property right now that's deeded that way that the world's find out they can't hardly get a hold of. And today, if you'd go back to old Bedford, Kentucky courthouse, and run down through the deeds, you'd find old Kellis Crow can deeded to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost for a wholeness camp meeting. High heaven's protecting that. Hallelujah. Dan Taylor went in there and moved, got a man to come in and saw. Saw that lumber and built a tabernacle. Called in some of our great old holiness preachers and preached holiness there for a few years. And the crowds got around there and said, we don't want this kind of preaching. We don't want this kind of stuff. And they voted him out. Said, we want a board. We want a committee on this thing. You know how they do it. And they shoved him out and shoved him aside. Wouldn't put him on the board. You say, what did he do next year? Did he drag his feet and stay away and say, well, just let him see how they get along with it. No, sir. He was there to help clean up the grounds. He was there to scrub the floors. He was there to put out the straw in the tabernacle. You said, did he go to services? Yes, sir. Sat right down in the front seat. And if the preacher said anything he could say amen to, he said amen. And when he couldn't say amen, he was praying. About five or six years went on like that, and that thing had turned worldly. The old tabernacle began to rot down, and they said, we can't have any services in it this year, no camp meeting. And God said to him, Dan Taylor, I want services there. He said, what must I do? He said, go back and repair it. And Dan Taylor went out again, took his money, took his time, and built the old tabernacle back, put a roof on it, and called the preachers. They let him go on two years like that and said to him, we want a board like we run it before, and voted him off and said, they did that three times to him. Dan Taylor never got sour, nor bitter, nor critical, nor charged God with folly, nor unfairness, nor said it was too much. No, sir, he went right on and served and glorified God and honored God. Let me jump, get to the end of this story. He was working one day back in the same garden where God had called him. And the man that had put a stand on the old Callis Grove campgrounds, opened it up on Sunday and sold stuff on Sunday and fought Dan Taylor, threatened Dan Taylor if he ever got around him or if he ever got on his property, he'd kill him. And somebody came racing down the road on a horse, stopped at Dan Taylor's yard, said, Dan Taylor! And Dan came from his garden around to him. He went out there and saw the young man who was the son of this fellow. He said, Dan... My father's dying, and he's afraid to die. He's dying. He just rolled and tossed on the bed through the night and all day yesterday, and my mother's almost frantic. Said she said to him a while ago, is there anybody you'd like to have come? Is there anyone that could be any peace or rest or ease to you? He said, there's one man, one man, one man that's got it if anybody could help me. And he, she said, who is it? He said, Dan Taylor. He said, the man I've hated and threatened to kill and opposed and fought but said he's got it. He's never shown anything to me but love. He's never spoken anything to me but kindness. He's never answered me in any way but as a Christian gentleman. He's like Jesus Christ living on earth. But he said, I don't think he'd come. She said, I believe he will. That boy said, Dan, would you come? He said, as soon as I can get my clothes changed. And Dan Taylor went in the house and bathed himself and changed his clothes and went on over to that man, took him an extra suit of clothes or just probably overalls and a shirt, underwear, Along with it, he said to the wife, you can go on about the cares of the home. You take care of the washing and the food, Matt. I'll stay right by this man. And Dan Taylor moved into that room to wait on that man and care for him, love him, pray over him and weep over him. 
until he led that land to God. And the man died with his arms around Dan Taylor's neck, shouting the victory and going home to glory. There's an unescapable result of these things. You just can't get around it. You just can't get around it. But back again in Kentucky, a young man came in one evening, storming. No, it was a beautiful night that, that evening when he came in from work. An expectant mother, his wife, he said to her, did you know I've been working hard today? Don't you know I've been a real strain and stress? And he said, here you have, you haven't got the cows in. She said, I never thought of it. I was busy working too. And he laid her out until it came so terrible. He was cursing and calling her names that nobody speak. What makes you get in a fit and a fury and say things you oughtn't do? A week or so slipped by and it was storming and rainy. And she realized he was working and he'd come in drenched and wet and tired and hungry. And she put on some clothes to protect her against the storm and the rain, put on her overshoes and slipped out to go get the cows, ran to take another tongue lashing and a beating. And he came home, she left him a note and told him where she'd gone. He waited for a while, saw the supper hot on the stove, the table set, everything ready. And then he got ashamed of himself and he slipped out. But there was no cowbells ringing. The fences were down, and the cattle had wandered over on another range out there. And he walked, labored, looked, listened for the bell, finally turned back and went home. But the home was still empty and no cows there. He, he did this three times, and the fourth time, about one o'clock in the morning, he turned and made his way back, tired and weary and hungry, cold, and he heard the cowbells. And he said, well, they've come home. She'll be home. And he looked around to the cow bells of the cows and saw them there. Walked over through the lot and out into the yard and into the house. Walked in and saw the supper still on the stove and the table set. And he said, Mabel, Mabel, but no answer. He said, Mabel, Mabel, but no answer. He walked into the room, the sitting room, and there she sat. Her head just over like this, her hair down over her face, her hands on the arms. He said, she's exhausted. An expectant mother, she would be. She would be. He started to turn away and just let her sit there to rest. And then he thought, she ought to get those wet clothes off and that hair ought to be dried. She'll catch cold, maybe pneumonia. And he spoke to her again, finally took a hold of her and shook her. But she was dead. A few feet from where he'd killed her with his tongue, a few weeks before, she was dead. I wonder who you and I have killed. I wonder how many in this congregation this morning are tongue damned. You'd make it through to heaven if you didn't have a tongue. You'd make it through to the city of God if you didn't have a tongue. But you've got a tongue. And because you've got a tongue, you've never brought it down to get sanctified. And you're tongue damned this morning. By your words will you be justified, or by your words will you be condemned. Man shall give an account to God for every idle word. Yes, sir. Life and death is in the power of the tongue, with every head bowed, with every eye closed.